and welcome to Family Folk Tales from the Nashville Public Library. I'm Susan Poulter, a librarian at the Main Library. Today's stories are the story of the three dervishes, sons of kings, and of five ladies of Baghdad, the story of the first dervish, son of a king, and the beginning of the story of the second dervish, son of a king. This is part three of our stories from the Arabian Nights Entertainments, selected and edited by Andrew Lang. The Story of the Three Dervishes, Sons of Kings, and of Five Ladies of Baghdad In the reign of the Caliph Harun al-Rashid, there lived at Baghdad a porter who, in spite of his humble calling, was an intelligent and sensible man. One morning he was sitting in his usual place with his basket before him, waiting to be hired, when a tall young lady, covered with a long muslin veil, came up to him and said, "'Pick up your basket and follow me.' The porter, who was greatly pleased by her appearance and voice, jumped up at once, poised his basket on his head, and accompanied the lady, saying to himself as he went, "'O oh, happy day! O oh, lucky meeting!' The lady soon stopped before a closed door, at which she knocked. It was opened by an old man with a long white beard, to whom the lady held out some money without speaking. The old man, who seemed to understand what she wanted, vanished into the house, and returned bringing a large jar of wine, which the porter placed in his basket. Then the lady signed to him to follow, and they went their way. The next place she stopped at was a fruit and flower shop, and here she bought a large quantity of apples, apricots, peaches, and other things, with lilies, jasmine, and all sorts of sweet-smelling plants. From this shop she went to a butcher's, a grocer's, and a poulterer's, till at last the porter exclaimed in despair, "'My good lady, if you had only told me you were going to buy enough provisions to stock a town, I would have brought a horse, or rather a camel.' The lady laughed and told him she had not finished yet, but after choosing various kinds of scents and spices from a drug store, she halted before a magnificent palace, at the door of which she knocked gently. The porteress who opened it was of such beauty that the eyes of the man were quite dazzled, and he was the more astonished as he saw clearly that she was no slave. The lady who had led him hither stood watching him with amusement, till the porteress exclaimed, "'Why don't you come in, my sister? This poor man is so heavily weighed down that he is ready to drop.' When they were both inside and the door was fastened, they all three entered a large court, surrounded by an open-work gallery. At one end of the court was a platform, and on the platform stood an amber throne, supported by four ebony columns, garnished with pearls and diamonds. In the middle of the court stood a marble basin filled with water from the mouth of a golden lion. The porter looked about him, noticing and admiring everything, but his attention was specially attracted by a third lady sitting on the throne who was even more beautiful than the other two. By the respect shown to her by the others, he judged that she must be the eldest, and in this he was right. This lady's name was Zobeda, the portress was Sadia, and the housekeeper was Amina. At a word from Zobeda, Sadia and Amina took the basket from the porter, who was glad enough to be relieved from its weight, and when it was emptied, paid him handsomely for its use. But instead of taking up his basket and going away, the man still lingered, till Zobeda inquired what he was waiting for, and if he expected more money. "'Oh, madam,' returned he, "'you have already given me too much, "'and I fear I may have been guilty of rudeness "'in not taking my departure at once. "'But if you will pardon my saying so, "'I was lost in astonishment "'at seeing such beautiful ladies by themselves. "'A company of women without men is, however, "'as dull as a company of men without women.' "'And after telling some stories to prove his point,' he ended by entreating them to let him stay and make a fourth at their dinner. 
the ladies were rather amused at the man's assurances, and after some discussion it was agreed that he should be allowed to stay, as his society might prove entertaining. "'But listen, friend,' said Zobeida, "'if we grant you your request, it is only on condition that you behave with the utmost politeness.' and that you keep secret our way of living, which chance has revealed to you. Then they all sat down to table, which had been covered by Amina, with the dishes she had bought. After the first few mouthfuls, Amina poured some wine into a golden cup. She first drank herself, according to the Arab custom, and then filled it for her sisters. When it came to the porter's turn, he kissed Amina's hand, and sang a song which he composed at the moment in praise of the wine. The three ladies were pleased with the song, and then sang themselves, so that the repast was a merry one, and lasted much longer than usual. At length, seeing that the sun was about to set, Sadia said to the porter, Rise and go. It is now time for us to separate. Oh, madam, replied he, how can you desire me to quit you in the state in which I am? Between the wine I have drunk and the pleasure of seeing you, I should never find the way to my house. Let me remain here till morning, and when I have recovered my senses, I will go when you like. Let him stay, said Amina, who had before proved herself his friend. It is only just as he has given us so much amusement. If you wish it, my sister, replied Zobeda, but if he does, I must make a new condition. Porter, she continued, turning to him, if you remain, you must promise to ask no questions about anything you may see. If you do, you may perhaps hear what you don't like. This being settled, Amina brought in supper and lit up the hall with a number of sweet-smelling tapers. Then they sat down again at the table and began with fresh appetites to eat, drink, sing, and recite verses. In fact, they were all enjoying themselves mightily when they heard a knock at the outer door, which Sadia rose to open. She would soon returned, saying that three dervishes, all blind in the right eye, and all with their heads, faces, and eyebrows clean-shaved, begged for admittance, as they were newly arrived in Baghdad, and night had already fallen. They seem to have pleasant manners, she added, but you have no idea how funny they look. I am sure we should find their company diverting. Zobeida and Amina made some difficulty about admitting the newcomers, and Sadia knew the reason of their hesitation. But she urged the matter so strongly that Zobeida was at last forced to consent. Bring them in, then, said she but make them understand that they are not to make remarks about what does not concern them, and be sure to make them read the inscription over the door. For on the door was written, in letters of gold, Whoso meddles in affairs that are no business of his will hear truths that will not please him. The three dervishes bowed low on entering, and thanked the ladies for their kindness and hospitality. The ladies replied with words of welcome, and they were all about to seat themselves when the eyes of the dervishes fell on the porter, whose dress was not so very unlike their own, though he still wore all the hair that nature had given him. This, said one of them, is apparently one of our Arab brothers who has rebelled against our ruler. The porter, although half asleep from the wine he had drunk, heard the words, and without moving cried angrily to the dervish, "'Sit down and mind your own business. Did you not read the inscription over the door? Everybody is not obliged to live in the same way.' "'Do not be so angry, my good man,' replied the dervish. "'We should be very sorry to displease you.' So the quarrel was smoothed over, and supper began in good earnest. When the dervishes had satisfied their hunger— they offered to play to their hostesses if there were any instruments in the house. The ladies were delighted at the idea, and Sadia went to see what she could find, returning in a few moments laden with two different kinds of flutes and a tambourine. Each dervish took the one he preferred and began to play a well-known air, while the ladies sang the words to the song. 
These words were the gayest and liveliest possible, and every now and then the singers had to stop to indulge the laughter which almost choked them. In the midst of all their noise, a knock was heard at the door. Now early that evening, the caliph secretly left the palace, accompanied by his grand vizier Jafar and Mesrur, chief of the eunuchs, all three wearing the dress of merchants. Passing down the street, the caliph had been attracted by the music of instruments and the sound of laughter, and had ordered his vizier to go and knock at the door of the house, as he wished to enter. The vizier replied that the ladies who lived there seemed to be entertaining their friends, and he thought his master would do well not to intrude on them. But the caliph had taken it into his head to see for himself, and insisted on being obeyed. The knock was answered by Sadia, with a taper in her hand, and the vizier, who was surprised at her beauty, bowed low before her and said respectfully, Madam, we are three merchants who have lately arrived from Mosul, and owing to a misadventure which befell us this very night, only reached our inn to find that the doors were closed to us till tomorrow morning. Not knowing what to do, we wandered in the streets till we happened to pass your house, when, seeing lights and hearing the sound of voices, we resolved to ask you to give us shelter till the dawn. If you will grant us this favor, we will, with your permission, do all in our power to help you spend the time pleasantly. Sadia answered the merchant that she must first consult her sisters, and after having talked over the matter with them, she returned to tell him that he and his two friends would be welcome to join their company. They entered, and bowed politely to the ladies and their guests. Then Zobeida, as the mistress, came forward and said gravely, You are welcome here, but I hope you will allow me to beg one thing of you. Have as many eyes as you like, but no tongues, and ask no questions about anything you see, however strange it may appear to you. Madam, replied the vizier, you shall be obeyed. We have quite enough to please and interest us without troubling ourselves about that with which we have no concern. Then they all sat down and drank to the health of the newcomers. While the vizier Jafar was talking to the ladies, the caliph was occupied in wondering who they could be, and why the three dervishes had each lost his right eye. He was burning to inquire the reason of it all, but was silenced by Zobeida's request, so he tried to rouse himself and to take his part in the conversation, which was very lively, the subject of discussion being the many different sorts of pleasures that there were in the world. After some time, the dervishes got up and performed some curious dances, which delighted the rest of the company. When they had finished, Zobeida rose from her seat, and, taking Amina by the hand, she said to her, My sister, our friends will excuse us if we seem to forget their presence and fulfill our nightly task. Amina understood her sister's meaning, and, collecting the dishes, glasses, and musical instruments, she carried them away, while Sadia swept the hall and put everything in order. Having done this, she begged the dervishes to sit on a sofa on one side of the room, and the caliph and his friends to place themselves opposite. As to the porter, she requested him to come and help her and her sister. Shortly after, Amina entered carrying a seat, which she put down in the middle of the empty space. She next went over to the door of a closet and signed to the porter to follow her. He did so, and soon reappeared, leading two black dogs by a chain, which he brought into the center of the hall. Zobeida then got up from her seat between the dervishes and the caliph and walked slowly across to where the porter stood with the dogs. "'We must do our duty,' she said with a deep sigh, pushing back her sleeves. And, taking a whip from Sadia, she said to the man, "'Take one of those dogs to my sister Amina, and give me the other.' The porter did as he was bid, but as he led the dog to Zobeda, it uttered piercing howls and gazed up at her with looks of entreaty. 
but Zobeida took no notice and whipped the dog till she was out of breath. She then took the chain from the porter, and, raising the dog on its hind legs, they looked into each other's eyes sorrowfully, till tears began to fall from both. Then Zobeida took her handkerchief and wiped the dog's eyes tenderly, after which she kissed it. Then, putting the chain into the porter's hand, she said, "'Take it back to the closet and bring me the other.' The same ceremony was gone through with the second dog, and all the while the whole company looked on with astonishment. The caliph in particular could hardly contain himself, and made signs to the vizier to ask what it all meant. But the vizier pretended not to see, and turned his head away. Zobeida remained for some time in the middle of the room, till at last Sadia went up to her and begged her to sit down, as she also had her part to play. At these words, Amina fetched a lute from a case of yellow satin and gave it to Sadia, who sang several songs to its accompaniment. When she was tired, she said to Amina, My sister, I can do no more. Come, I pray you, and take my place. Amina struck a few chords and then broke into a song which she sang with so much ardor she was quite overcome and sank gasping onto a pile of cushions, tearing open her dress as she did so to give herself some air. To the amazement of all present, her neck, instead of being as smooth and white as her face, was a mask of scars. The dervishes and the caliph looked at each other and whispered together, unheard by Zobeida and Sadia, who were tending their fainting sister. "'What does it all mean?' asked the caliph. "'We know no more than you,' said the dervish to whom he had spoken. "'What, you do not belong to the house?' "'My lord,' answered all the dervishes together, "'we came here for the first time an hour before you.' They then turned to the porter to see if he could explain the mystery, but the porter was no wiser than they were themselves. At length the caliph could contain his curiosity no longer— and declared that he would compel the ladies to tell them the meaning of their strange conduct. The vizier, foreseeing what would happen, implored him to remember the condition their hostesses had imposed, and added in a whisper that if his highness would only wait till morning, he could, as caliph, summon the ladies to appear before him. But the caliph, who was not accustomed to being contradicted, rejected this advice, and it was resolved after a little more talking that the question should be put by the porter. Suddenly Zobeida turned round, and seeing their excitement, she said, What is the matter? What are you all discussing so earnestly? Madam, answered the porter, these gentlemen entreat you to explain to them why you should first whip the dogs and then cry over them, and also how it happens that the fainting lady is covered with scars. They have requested me, madam, to be their mouthpiece. Is it true, gentlemen, asked Zobeida, drawing herself up, that you have charged this man to put me that question? It is, they all replied, except Jafar, who was silent. Is this, continued Zobeida, growing more angry every moment, is this the return you make for the hospitality I have shown you? Have you forgotten the one condition on which you were allowed to enter the house? Come quickly, she added, clapping her hands three times, and the words were hardly uttered when seven slaves, each armed with a saber, burst in and stood over the seven men, throwing them on the ground and preparing themselves, on a sign from their mistress, to cut off their heads. The seven culprits all thought their last hour had come, and the caliph repented bitterly that he had not taken the vizier's advice. But they made up their minds to die bravely, all except the porter, who loudly inquired of Zobeida why he was to suffer for other people's faults, and declared that these misfortunes would never have happened if it had not been for the dervishes, who always brought ill luck. He ended by imploring Zobeida not to confound the innocent with the guilty and to spare his life. In spite of her anger, there was something so comic in the groans of the porter 
that Zobeida could not refrain from laughing. But putting him aside, she addressed the others a second time, saying, Answer me, who are you? Unless you tell me truly, you have not another moment to live. I can hardly think you are men of any position, whatever country you belong to. If you were, you would have had more consideration for us. The caliph, who was naturally very impatient, suffered far more than either of the others at feeling that his life was at the mercy of a justly offended lady. But when he heard her question, he began to breathe more freely, for he was convinced that she had only to learn his name and rank for all danger to be over. So he whispered hastily to the vizier who was next to him to reveal their secret. But the vizier, wiser than his master, wished to conceal from the public the affront they had received, and merely answered, After all, we have only got what we deserved. Meanwhile, Zobeida had turned to the three dervishes, and inquired if, as they were all blind, they were brothers. No, madam, replied one, we are no blood relations at all, only brothers by our mode of life. And you, she asked, addressing another, were you born blind of one eye? No, madam, returned he. I became blind through a most surprising adventure, such as probably has never happened to anybody. After that I shaved my head and eyebrows, and put on the dress in which you see me now. Zobeida put the same question to the other two dervishes, and received the same answer. But, added the third, it may interest you, madam, to know that we are not men of low birth, but are all three sons of kings, and of kings too whom the world holds in high esteem. At these words Zobeida's anger cooled down, and she turned to her slaves and said, You can give them a little more liberty, but do not leave the hall. Those that will tell us their histories and their reasons for coming here shall be allowed to leave unheard. Those who refuse— and she paused. But in a moment the porter, who understood that he had only to relate his story to set himself free from this terrible danger, immediately broke in. Madam, you already know how I came here, and what I have to say will soon be told. Your sister found me this morning in the place where I always stand waiting to be hired. She bade me follow her to various shops, and when my basket was quite full, we returned to this house— where you had the goodness to permit me to remain, for which I shall be eternally grateful. That is my story. He looked anxiously to Zobeida, who nodded her head and said, You can go, and take care we never meet again. Oh, madam, cried the porter, let me stay just a little while. It is not just that the others should have heard my story, and that I should not hear theirs. And without waiting for permission, he seated himself on the end of the sofa occupied by the ladies, whilst the rest crouched on the carpet, and the slaves stood against the wall. Then one of the dervishes, addressing himself to Zobeida as the principal lady, began his story. The Story of the First Dervish, Son of a King In order, madam, to explain how I came to lose my right eye, and to wear the dress of a dervish, you must first know that I am the son of a king. My father's only brother reigned over the neighboring country, and had two children, a daughter and a son, who were of the same age as myself. As I grew up and was allowed more liberty, I went every year to pay a visit to my uncle's court, and usually stayed there about two months. In this way my cousin and I became very intimate, and were much attached to each other. The very last time I saw him, he seemed more delighted to see me than ever, and gave a great feast in my honor. When we had finished eating, he said to me, My cousin, you would never guess what I have been doing since your last visit to us. Directly after your departure, I set a number of men to work on a building after my own design. It is now completed and ready to be lived in. I should like to show it to you, but you must first swear two things, to be faithful to me and to keep my secret. Of course I did not dream of refusing him anything he asked, and gave the promise without the least hesitation. 
He then bade me wait an instant and vanished, returning in a few moments with a richly dressed lady of great beauty. But as he did not tell me her name, I thought it was better not to inquire. We all three sat down to table and amused ourselves with talking of all sorts of indifferent things and with drinking each other's health. Suddenly the prince said to me, "'Cousin, we have no time to lose. Be so kind as to conduct this lady to a certain spot where you will find a dome-like tomb, newly built. You cannot mistake it. Go in, both of you, and wait till I come. I shall not be long.' As I had promised, I prepared to do as I was told, and giving my hand to the lady, I escorted her by the light of the moon to the place of which the prince had spoken. We had barely reached it when he joined us himself, carrying a small vessel of water, a pickaxe, and a little bag containing plaster. With a pickaxe he at once began to destroy the empty sepulchre in the middle of the tomb. One by one he took the stones and piled them up in a corner. When he had knocked down the whole sepulchre, he proceeded to dig at the earth and beneath where the sepulchre had been I saw a trap door. He raised the door, and I caught sight of the top of a spiral staircase. Then he said, turning to the lady, Madam, this is the way that will lead you down to the spot which I told you of. The lady did not answer, but silently descended the staircase, the prince following her. At the top, however, he looked at me. My cousin, he exclaimed, I do not know how to thank you for your kindness. Farewell. What do you mean? I cried. I don't understand. No matter, he replied. Go back by the path that you came. He would say no more, and, greatly puzzled, I returned to my room in the palace and went to bed. When I woke and considered my adventure, I thought that I must have been dreaming, and sent a servant to ask if the prince was dressed and could see me. But on hearing that he had not slept at home, I was much alarmed, and hastened to the cemetery, where, unluckily, the tombs were all so alike, that I could not discover which was the one I was in search of, though I spent four days in looking for it. You must know that all this time the king, my uncle, was absent on a hunting expedition, and as no one knew when he would be back— I at last decided to return home. Leaving the ministers to make my excuses, I longed to tell them what had become of the prince, about whose fate they felt the most dreadful anxiety, but the oath I had sworn kept me silent. On arrival at my father's capital, I was astonished to find a large detachment of guards drawn up before the gate of the palace. They surrounded me directly I entered. I asked the officers in command the reason for this strange behavior, and was horrified to learn that the army had mutinied and put to death the king, my father, and had placed the grand vizier on the throne. Further, that by his orders I was placed under arrest. Now this rebel vizier had hated me from my boyhood, because once when I was shooting at a bird with a bow, I had shot out his eye by accident. Of course, I not only sent a servant at once to offer him my regrets and apologies, but I made them in person. It was all of no use. He cherished an undying hatred towards me, and lost no occasion of showing it. Having once got me in his power, I felt he could show no mercy, and I was right. Mad with triumph and fury, he came to me in my prison and tore out my right eye. That is how I lost it. My persecutor, however, did not stop here. He shut me up in a large case and ordered his executioner to carry me into a desert place to cut off my head and to then abandon my body to the birds of prey. The case with me inside it was accordingly placed on a horse, and the executioner, accompanied by another man, rode into the country until they found a spot suitable for the purpose but their hearts were not so hard as they seemed, and my tears and prayers made them waver. Forsake the kingdom instantly, said the executioner at last, and take care never to come back, for you will not only lose your head, but make us lose ours. 
I thanked him gratefully and tried to console myself for the loss of my eye by thinking of the other misfortunes I had escaped. After all I had gone through and my fear of being recognized by some enemy, I could only travel very slowly and cautiously, generally resting in some out-of-the-way place by day and walking as far as I was able by night. But at length I arrived in the kingdom of my uncle, of whose protection I was sure. I found him in great trouble about the disappearance of his son, who had, he said, vanished without leaving a trace. But his own grief did not prevent him sharing mine. We mingled our tears, for the loss of one was the loss of the other. And then I made up my mind that it was my duty to break the solemn oath I had sworn to the prince. I therefore lost no time in telling my uncle everything I knew, and I observed that even before I had ended his sorrow appeared to be lightened a little. My dear nephew, he said, your story gives me some hope. I was aware that my son was building a tomb, and I think I can find the spot. But as he wished to keep the matter secret, let us go alone and seek the place ourselves. He then bade me disguise myself, and we both slipped out of a garden door, which opened onto the cemetery. It did not take long for us to arrive at the scene of the prince's disappearance, or to discover the tomb I had sought so vainly before. We entered it, and found the trap-door which led to the staircase, but we had great difficulty in raising it because the prince had fastened it down underneath with the plaster he had brought with him. My uncle went first, and I followed him. When we reached the bottom of the stairs, we stepped into a sort of ante-room, filled with such a dense smoke that it was hardly possible to see anything. However, we passed through the smoke into a large chamber, which at first seemed quite empty. The room was brilliantly lighted, and in another moment we perceived a sort of platform at one end, on which were the bodies of the prince and a lady, both half-burned, as if they had been dragged out of a fire before it had quite consumed them. This horrible sight turned me faint, but to my surprise my uncle did not show so much surprise as anger. I knew, he said, that my son was tenderly attached to this lady, whom I thought whom it was impossible that he should ever marry. I tried to turn his thoughts and presented to him the most beautiful princesses but he cared for none of them, and, as you see, they have now been united by a horrible death in an underground tomb. But as he spoke, his anger melted into tears, and again I wept with him. When he recovered himself, he drew me to him. My dear nephew, he said, embracing me, you have come to me to take his place, and I will do my best to forget that I ever had a son who could act in so wicked a manner. Then he turned and went up the stairs. We reached the palace without anyone having noticed our absence, when shortly after, a clashing of drums and cymbals and the blare of trumpets burst upon our astonished ears. At the same time, a thick cloud of dust on the horizon told of the approach of a great army. My heart sank, when I perceived that the commander was the vizier who had dethroned my father and was coming to seize the kingdom of my uncle. The capital was utterly unprepared to stand a siege, and seeing that resistance was useless, at once opened its gates. My uncle fought hard for his life, but was soon overpowered, and when he fell, I managed to escape through a secret passage and took refuge with an officer whom I knew I could trust. Persecuted by ill fortune and stricken with grief, there seemed to be only one means of safety left to me. I shaved my beard and my eyebrows and put on the dress of a dervish, in which it was easy for me to travel without being known. I avoided the towns until I reached the kingdom of the famous and powerful caliph, Harun al-Rashid, when I had no further reason to fear my enemies. It was my intention to come to Baghdad and to throw myself at the feet of His Highness, who would, I felt certain, be touched by my sad story 
and would grant me, besides, his help and protection. After a journey which lasted some months, I arrived at length at the gates of this city. It was sunset, and I paused for a little to look about me and to decide which way to turn my steps. I was still debating on this subject when I was joined by this other dervish, who stopped to greet me. "'You, like me, appear to be a stranger,' I said. He replied that I was right, and before he could say more, the third dervish came up. He also was newly arrived in Baghdad, and being brothers in misfortune, we resolved to cast in our lots together and to share whatever fate might have in store. By this time it had grown late, and we did not know where to spend the night. But our lucky star having guided us to this door, we took the liberty of knocking and of asking for shelter, which was given to us at once with the best grace in the world. This, madam, is my story. I am satisfied, replied Zobeida. You can go when you like. The dervish, however, begged leave to state and to hear the histories of his two friends and of the three other persons of the company, which he was allowed to do. The Story of the Second Dervish, Son of a King Madam, said the young man, addressing Zobeida, if you wish to know how I lost my right eye, I shall have to tell you the story of my whole life. I was scarcely more than a baby when the king, my father, finding me unusually quick and clever for my age, turned his thoughts to my education. I was taught first to read and write, and then to learn the Quran, which is the basis of our holy religion, and the better to understand it, I read with my tutors the ablest commentators on its teaching, and committed to memory all the traditions respecting the Prophet, which have been gathered from the mouth of those who were his friends. I also learnt history, and was instructed in poetry, versification, geography, chronology, and in all the outdoor exercises in which every prince should excel. But what I liked best of all was writing Arabic characters— and in this I soon surpassed my masters, and gained a reputation in this branch of knowledge that reached as far as India itself. Now the Sultan of the Indies, curious to see a young prince with such strange tastes, sent an ambassador to my father, laden with rich presents, and a warm invitation to visit his court. My father, who was deeply anxious to secure the friendship of so powerful a monarch, and held besides that a little travel would greatly improve my manners and open my mind, accepted gladly, and in a short time I had set out for India with the ambassador, attended only by a small suite on account of the length of the journey and the badness of the roads. However, as was my duty, I took with me ten camels laden with rich presents for the sultan. We had been traveling for about a month, when one day we saw a cloud of dust moving swiftly towards us, and as soon as it came near we found that the dust concealed a band of fifty robbers. Our men barely numbered half, and as we were also hampered by the camels, there was no use in fighting. So we tried to overawe them by informing them who we were and whither we were going. The robbers, however, only laughed, and declared that was none of their business, and without more words— attacked us brutally. I defended myself to the last, wounded though I was, but at length, seeing that resistance was hopeless, and that the ambassador and all our followers were made prisoners, I put spurs to my horse, and rode away as fast as I could, till the poor beast fell dead from a wound in its side. I managed to jump off without any injury, and looked about to see if I was pursued. But for the moment I was safe, for, as I imagined, the robbers were all engaged in quarreling over their booty. I found myself in a country that was quite new to me, and dared not return to the main road, lest I should again fall into the hands of the robbers. Luckily, my wound was only a slight one, and after binding it up as well as I could, I walked on for the rest of the day till I reached a cave at the foot of a mountain, where I passed the night in peace— making my supper off some fruits I had gathered on the way. 
I wandered about for a whole month, without knowing where I was going, till at length I found myself on the outskirts of a beautiful city, watered by winding streams, which enjoyed an eternal spring. My delight at the prospect of mixing once more with human beings was somewhat damped at the thought of the miserable object I must seem. My face and hands had been burned nearly black, my clothes were all in rags, and my shoes were in such a state that I had been forced to abandon them altogether. I entered the town and stopped at a tailor's shop to inquire where I was. The man saw I was better than my condition and begged me to sit down, and in return I told him my whole story. The tailor listened with attention, but his reply, instead of giving me consolation, only increased my trouble. Beware, he said, of telling anyone what you've told me, for the prince who governs the kingdom is your father's greatest enemy, and he will be rejoiced to find you in his power. I thanked the tailor for his counsel, and said I would do whatever he advised. Then, being very hungry, I gladly ate of the food he put before me, and accepted his offer of a lodging in his house. In a few days I had quite recovered from the hardships I had undergone, and then the tailor, knowing that it was the custom for the princes of our religion to learn a trade or profession so as to provide for themselves in times of ill fortune, inquired if there was anything I could do for my living. I replied that I had been educated as a grammarian and a poet, but that my greatest gift was writing. All of that is of no use here, said the tailor. Take my advice. Put on a short coat, and as you seem hardy and strong, go into the woods and cut firewood, which you will sell in the streets. By this means you will earn your living and be able to wait till better times come. The hatchet and the cord shall be my present. This counsel was very distasteful to me, but I thought I could not do otherwise than adopt it. So the next morning I set out with a company of poor woodcutters to whom the tailor had introduced me. Even on the first day I cut enough wood to sell for a tolerable sum, and very soon I became more expert and had made enough money to repay the tailor all he had lent me. I had been a woodcutter for more than a year, when one day I wandered further into the forest than I had ever done before, and reached a delicious green glade where I began to cut wood. I was hacking at the root of a tree when I beheld an iron ring fastened to a trap door of the same metal. I soon cleared away the earth, and pulling up the door found a staircase, which I hastily made up my mind to go down, carrying my hatchet with me by way of protection. When I reached the bottom, I discovered that I was in a huge palace, as brilliantly lighted as any palace above ground that I had ever seen, with a long gallery supported by pillars of jasper ornamented with capitals of gold. Down this gallery a lady came to meet me, of such beauty that I forgot everything else and thought only of her. To save her all the trouble possible, I hastened towards her, and bowed low. "'Who are you? Who are you?' she asked. "'A man or a genie?' "'A man, madam,' I replied. "'I have nothing to do with genies.' "'By what accident do you come here?' she asked again with a sigh. "'I have been in this place now for five and twenty years, "'and you are the first man who has visited me.' "'Emboldened by her beauty and gentleness, "'I ventured to reply, "'Before, madam, I answer your question.' Allow me to say how grateful I am for this meeting, which is not only a consolation to me in my own heavy sorrow, but may perhaps enable me to render your lot happier. And then I told her who I was and how I had come there. Alas, prince, she said with a deeper sigh than before, you have guessed rightly in supposing me an unwilling prisoner in this gorgeous place. I am the daughter of the king of the Ebony Isle of whose fame you surely must have heard. At my father's desire, I was married to a prince who was my own cousin, but on my very wedding day, I was snatched up by a genie and brought here in a faint. For a long while I did nothing but weep and would not suffer the genie to come near me. 
but time teaches us submission, and I have now got accustomed to his presence. And if clothes and jewels could content me, I would have them in plenty. Every tenth day, for five and twenty years, I have received a visit from him. But in case I should need his help at any other time, I have only to touch a talisman that stands at the entrance to my chamber. It wants still five days to his next visit, and I hope that during that time you will do me the honor to be my guest. I was too much dazzled by her beauty to dream of refusing her offer, and accordingly the princess had me conducted to the bath, and a rich dress befitting my rank was provided for me. Then a feast of the most delicate dishes was served in a room hung with embroidered Indian fabrics. Next day, when we were at dinner, I could maintain my patience no longer, and implored the princess to break her bonds and return with me to the world which was lighted by the sun. "'What you ask is impossible,' she answered. "'But stay here with me instead, and we can be happy, and all you will have to do is to take yourself to the forest every tenth day, when I am expecting my master the genie. He is very jealous, as you know, and will not suffer a man to come near me.' "'Princess,' I replied, "'I see it is only fear of the genie that makes you act like this.' For myself, I dread him so little that I mean to break his talisman in pieces. Awful though you think him, he shall feel the weight of my arm, and I herewith take a solemn vow to stamp out the whole race. The princess, who realized the consequences of such audacity, entreated me not to touch the talisman. If you do, it will be the ruin of both of us, said she. I know genies much better than you. But the wine I had drunk had confused my brain. I gave one kick to the talisman, and it fell into a thousand pieces. Hardly had my foot touched the talisman when the air became as dark as night. A fearful noise was heard, and the palace shook to its very foundations. In an instant I was sobered, and understood what I had done. Princess, I cried, what is happening? Alas, she exclaimed, forgetting all her own terrors in anxiety for me, fly or you are lost. I followed her advice and dashed up the staircase, leaving my hatchet behind me, but I was too late. The palace opened and the genie appeared, who, turning angrily to the princess, asked indignantly, What is the matter that you have sent for me like this? A pain in my heart, she replied hastily obliged me to seek the aid of this little bottle. Feeling faint, I slipped and fell against the talisman, which broke. That is really all. You are an impudent liar, cried the genie. How did this hatchet and those shoes get here? I never saw them before, she answered. And you came in such a hurry that you may have picked them up on the road without knowing it. To this the genie only replied by insults and blows. I could hear the shrieks and groans of the princess, and having by this time taken off my rich garments and put on those in which I had arrived the previous day, I lifted the trap, found myself once more in the forest, and returned to my friend the tailor with a light load of wood and a heart full of shame and sorrow. The tailor, who had been uneasy at my long absence, was delighted to see me, but I kept silence about my adventure and as soon as possible retired to my room to lament in secret over my folly. While I was thus indulging my grief, my host entered and said, There is an old man downstairs who has brought your hatchet and slippers, which he picked up on the road and now restores to you, as he found out from one of your comrades where you lived. You had better come down and speak to him yourself. At this speech I changed color, and my legs trembled under me. The tailor noticed my confusion and was just going to inquire the reason, when the door of the room opened and the old man appeared, carrying with him my hatchet and shoes. I am a genie, he said, the son of the daughter of Eblis, prince of the genies. Is not this hatchet yours and these shoes? Without waiting for an answer, which indeed I could hardly have given him, so great was my fright, he seized hold of me 
and darted up into the air with the quickness of lightning, and then, with equal swiftness, dropped down towards the earth. When he touched the ground, he wrapped it with his foot. It opened, and we found ourselves in the enchanted place, in the presence of the beautiful princess of the Ebony Isle. But how different she looked from what she was when I had last seen her, for she was lying stretched on the ground covered with blood and weeping bitterly. Traitress, cried the genie, is not this man your lover? She lifted up her eyes slowly and looked sadly at me. I never saw him before, she answered slowly. I do not know who he is. What, exclaimed the genie, you owe all your sufferings to him, and yet you dare to say he's a stranger to you. But if he really is a stranger to me, she replied, why should I tell a lie and cause his death? Very well, said the genie, drawing his sword. Take this and cut off his head. Alas, answered the princess, I am too weak even to hold the saber. And supposing that I had the strength, why should I put an innocent man to death? You condemn yourself by your refusal, said the genie. Then, turning to me, he added, And you, do you not know her? How should I, I replied, resolved to imitate the princess in her fidelity. How should I, when I never saw her before? Cut off her head, then, if she's a stranger to you, and I shall believe you are speaking the truth, and will set you at liberty. Certainly, I answered, taking the saber in my hands, and making a sign to the princess to fear nothing, as it was my own life I was about to sacrifice, and not hers. But the look of gratitude she gave me shook my courage, and I flung the saber to the earth. I should not deserve to live, I said to the genie, if I were such a coward as to slay a lady who is not only unknown to me, but who is at this moment half dead herself. Do with me as you will. I am in your power. But I refuse to obey your cruel command. I see, said the genie, that you have both made up your minds to brave me, but I will give you a sample of what you may expect. So saying, with one sweep of his saber, he cut off a hand of the princess, who was just able to lift the other to wave me an eternal farewell. Then I lost consciousness for several minutes. When I came to myself, I implored the genie to keep me no longer in this state of suspense, but to lose no time in putting an end to my sufferings. The genie, however, paid no attention to my prayers, but said sternly, that is the way in which a genie treats the woman who has betrayed him. If I chose, I could kill you also. But I will be merciful and content myself with changing you into a dog, an ass, a lion, or a bird, whichever you prefer. I caught eagerly at these words as giving me a faint hope of softening his wrath. O oh, genie, I cried, as you wish to spare my life, be generous and spare it altogether. Grant my prayer and pardon my crime, as the best man in the whole world forgave his neighbor, who was eaten up with envy of him. Contrary to my hopes, the genie seemed interested in my words, and said he would like to hear the story of the two neighbors. And as I think, madam, it may please you, I will tell it to you also. That was... The Story of the Three Dervishes, Sons of Kings, and of Five Ladies of Baghdad, The Story of the First Dervish, Son of a King, and the Beginning of The Story of the Second Dervish, Son of a King, from the Arabian Nights Entertainments, selected and edited by Andrew Lang. Special thanks to Ginger Sands for our theme music. You can find more of Ginger's music at iTunes, or on her website at www.gingersands.com. And if you'd like to comment on today's story, send me an email. I can be reached at susan.polter, that's P-O-U-L-T-E-R, at nashville.gov. Thanks for listening. <music>